Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about rewiring education for people and planet. We're going to start with a quick video to get us thinking more about this theme. If you asked me how we got to this point, I couldn't tell you. People, well, let's just say they've changed. I consider myself lucky if I don't get robbed on my way anywhere. And jobs? Getting one is like winning the lottery. I'd like to think that at least we know we've messed up by now, but it's too late. Who am I kidding? Look at all this. It's way too late. Things are breaking left and right. AI already took most jobs that were left because people were too lazy to educate themselves as it became smarter than them. Instead, they enjoyed the new technology and conveniences that came with it. Now we're playing catch up and failing hard. Flying cars, big whoop. They don't even work anymore. Our ancestors were all about becoming rich, but at what cost? If we could pinpoint the moment when things went wrong and change them, would we? Or would we take the same greedy path over and over again? Humanity is the price we've paid. Well, almost, at least. Look at us. We were happy back then. People had jobs, families, and one of our main goals was quality education. The SDGs were set. In fact, many would say education was better than ever before. Then, of course, came 2020. COVID hit us like a wildfire. The whole world changed in what felt like a single day. We went virtual. We had to. Before we knew it, technology had advanced way faster than we could keep up with. It's too late. We failed. All the work our ancestors did to build us a brighter future. Wasted. Is this what we want our legacy to be? No. We can stop this. Right here and right now, you can change the course of history. You are the answer. You are the mind we need. You are the voice that will echo into the future. We can make a change and we will be the answer. But we must be in this together. So some powerful words to start the morning then. I think, is this what we want our legacy to be is a great way, a uh, great mindset with which to start this discussion. So now to say some words of welcome on behalf of all of the organizers and co-hosts, I'd like to introduce His Excellency Dr. Tariq al Gurg, the CEO of Dubai Cares. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everyone. And <clears throat> Thank you for making it uh, uh, such early at this time and, uh, and, and, and I would like to congratulate every one of you finding the way to room number nine as well. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you. Um, it, it's, it's worth mentioning how we have reached to this point and how did we start and, 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 and what we were thinking of. 
Of course, rewired was an idea that us as Dubai Cares had uh, probably three years prior to the summit. So we're talking three and a half years ago. And, uh, and the reason is because, as you know, at that time, the sector was divided, it was fragmented. It is actually COVID with me, which made us more united. And we are united more than ever, but a lot needs to be done. And it was last December. And in November uh, 21, uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, did announce the tests. Now, a lot of people, including my staff, they said, we have competition. And I said, no, no, this is the best thing that has ever happened to Rewired. And they said, why? We said, because look, our power is convening. Our power, we get all the voices of the world, UN, government, non-government, but the test is, is, is a member state led summit that can only work with governments, meaning they have the power of advocacy. We don't. So that was the idea that they will play the role of advocacy and policy change and transformation of education. And our job is to get the voices and get all the feedback. And it clicked. And I spoke to Amina Mohammed. We had a meeting in November. So Rewired becomes a partner with TESS from November and that we will come out with an outcomes report from TESS, an outcomes report that will be generic to the whole world, but then we will have another extraction of the report specifically to the TESS, to the five action tracks. And I told her at that time, we were very well prepared. In November, I told her, we're appointing the Education Commission. Even before I spoke to you, Elizabeth, I had you in mind. So, so uh, and who's the best to do this uh, uh, other than the Education Commission? Um, um, we've been friends uh, um, for almost a decade. Um, uh, we are one team for almost a decade uh, in, in various stuff in the world. And, uh, uh, and to make this happen, we can't do this alone. Uh, uh, the ministers and the first lady here, they will share their feedback on transforming education. But as, as, as equally important, we need to hear from you because this is an ongoing process. This is a journey and, and officially to the, to the public, the journey starts today. We've been working on our, our small pieces. What you're gonna see is not the final report. This is just the first. Uh, my team keeps on telling me don't use the word draft, but I will say it's a draft. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and we have identified six, I'm not going to go through them, that will be Lisbeth. We identified six key priorities that has to be prioritized by the world, regardless of tests. We are pushing the agenda towards the tests. Why did I speak to Amina Muhammad? Is because Amina Muhammad said that she wants this report of Rewired to be the a main building block at the test. That's how, how we are partners since November. And hopefully with your feedback, with your continuous feedback from now until September. It's like two months only, right? It's, in my mind, it's like six months. Um, um, it will be important. There's a small survey on that postcard, seven questions, very easy. And the last, the seventh question is, put your own feedback on transforming education. Um, um, I, I really mean it. We will never do this together. This whole video that you saw is the story of humanity if we don't do anything in education. This is inevitable if we don't do anything in education, without any doubt. Thank you very much for coming and, and, and please enjoy and, and you'll have a very good time for Q&A or even if you want to put any remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Aishwarya Machani. I'm an advisor to the Our Future Agenda Initiative at the UN Foundation, which is a newly launched initiative focusing on putting the um, interests of young people and future generations at the top of the international agenda. And in case you haven't guessed, I will be your moderator for today. Um, so as all of you will know, we are facing a unprecedented series of critical challenges. But a transformation in education has the potential to dramatically change the prospect for young people and future generations. However, amidst competing priorities and limited resources, 
genuine transformation of education work will require us to stop thinking in silos and recognize the interconnectedness of the SDGs. And it's this cross-sectoral approach that we really want to promote in today's session. So in terms of an agenda then, we'll start with a presentation by Dr. Lisbeth Steer, who's the Executive Director of the Education Commission. We'll then have comments from each of our fantastic panelists. Then we'll have time for an interactive discussion where I'll be taking comments and questions from the floor. And then we'll have final remarks from Dr. Steer and Dr. Algor. So with that, uh, we're going to be begin with our presentation from Dr. Lisbeth Steer, as I said, the Executive Director of the Education Commission, which is currently chaired by the UN Secretary General's Envoy for Global Education, Gordon Brown. So Lisbeth, over to you to share some of the research that you've been doing with Dubai Cares about win-win solutions for education and beyond. Great, thank you, Aish, and thank you to all of you here on the panel. It's um, a real honor to be sitting here with uh, such a high-powered panel. So I'm humbled uh, to be here also with all of you in the audience to talk about this really critical subject. And uh, last night I was at a dinner um, with a minister from Egypt and some other people and one of the key issues that was being discussed there was, why are people not on the streets? Why is education in such deep crisis, but actually people are just going about their business? We do see people on the street when it comes to climate change. We do see people protesting when, when people are dying from health issues. But somehow education um, seems to kind of slip by. Some people have called it the silent crisis. The reason why we are here today is because we would like to change that. And the way to change that is by making ourselves relevant to other people's problems. And we are thinking too much about education in our own rooms here, we talk to each other, we all agree, but actually we should be in other people's rooms. We should be, the First Lady just came from Lisbon, where there is a big ocean conference. We should be there. That is why we are here today, to de determine how could we find these win-win solutions so we can make sure that moving forward, Maybe we don't attend this conference, but go somewhere else and make sure that we can be part of the movement that is going on in other sectors and make ourselves relevant to that, because that is really why education is needed. And I think the video, um, and I should say rewired, I don't know who was there, amazing. Um, thousands of people turned up in the middle of the pandemic, a great conference. And what was so special about it was this video this recognition that um, actually the world, the things that were mentioned was greediness, jobs, well-being, there were pictures of nature, health, technology. Actually, education didn't feature that much in there. The picture was really about all these other things that, not, that will go wrong if we don't do something about education. So that's what, if we go to the next slide, um, that's on the left-hand side if you click. So actually what we should do is really focus on these statistics um, because those are the things that we should keep in mind every day when we think about our education issues. Um, it's about the, the rise in extreme poverty since the pandemic. It's about children and people who are food insecure and malnourished. It's about um, slips in or, or reversals in health, uh, basic hygiene that's not there, unemployment around the world, um, and also obviously the big issue of climate change. So then in the next uh, slide is, in the next side is all these uh, statistics that we've been, been hearing about this conference, in this conference. So I really would like us to focus on the left-hand side um, and, and think about, okay, if we wanted to solve the left-hand side, what should we be doing together with the people who care about that? So going to the, um, the next slide, um, what we have been doing is basically, um, as Aish was saying, 
trying to put a team together that tries to think about, okay, which of these win-win solutions are out there that we could pursue that um, we could put forward for sectors to work together on. And um, as I shared, said, um, stop talking about education alone. Um, let's talk about partnerships um, and how education can help us solve these bigger problems. So um, we came up with a list. And as Tariq said, it's a draft. <laughs> we really do want your feedback. This is genuinely, we, we have only two months, but we do really want your feedback on this. So please go to the survey. Um, because this is not supposed to be every problem in the world or just, just we're going to solve everything. But we're really trying to find some critical things that we know really matter to these big problems that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And we know they are also really effective uh, to improve education. So uh, there they are. They are um, expanding early childhood programs. They are building a team-based education workforce, scaling adaptive, inclusive, and engaging teaching, scaling school meals and school health interventions, creating diverse and certifiable rules, uh, routes to skills, and adapting education systems to climate resilience and green skills. Now, I will take you quickly through this because I want to explain a little bit how they connect to these bigger issues. So first of all, um, if you think about the statistic around poverty and sort of cycles of poverty, one of the key ways to break cycles of poverty is give people a good and solid start in life because poverty and the intergenerational nature of poverty starts very early on. If a child is malnourished, if a, if a child is not, uh, doesn't get the stimulation, we've already actually predestined this child. So um, the problem is that conditions uh, for poverty start really early and that we know that uh, 250 million children under the age of five are, not, are at risk of not reaching their development potential. So what we are saying is, and this seems kind of common uh, to all of us, but really emphasizing, and it's not just about pre-primary education, it's also about the health interventions, the nutrition and the stimulation. So we really need to work together. And I think early childhood is probably the place in education where we've done that best. So this is maybe the easiest one to start with. So having these multi-sectoral strategies that have these sec bind these sectors together are really important and making sure that um, the uh, parents get, we involve parents and communities in this because we all know from the evidence how important this early stimulation is and the engagement of parents in that. So um, the, I'll go to the next one because I think you um, are probably fairly familiar with the first one. This one is a little, is, an, is a kind of other uh, proposal. So what I've always found and when the commission did its work initially was that when we speak to education uh, sector experts, we get a lot about teachers. And so you go into a room and we need to work on teachers. And I've always felt a little uncomfortable with that because when you go to a meeting that's on the health sector, there isn't meetings that say we should just focus on doctors or we should just focus on nurses. No, actually the health sector talks about the health workforce. And so every time I walk into a room and I hear this is going to be about teachers, I honestly do feel um, slightly uh, uncomfortable. And we back in the commission, we did some research actually looking at how many staff are there for one per teacher and how many staff are there per one doctor. I know that's a bit of a kind of odd comparison, but still there are many more people that surround a health worker than there are people who surround a teacher. So what we have been working on also in the commission is we should move from this outdated model where we talk about a sort of teacher at the center of sort of a classroom 
towards a model where we actually have children at the center of an education workforce. And that workforce needs to include teachers, but it needs to include a lot of other roles. And that gets us to the multi-sectoral issue, bringing the health sector um, to, the, to, to the table. Why do we have community health workers, but not community education workers. Um, so how could we bring uh, these various uh, people uh, together? And that is uh, what we call learning teams. And we, we believe this is particularly important for health and well-being, because mental health issues, health issues can be addressed again together through creating this multidimensional workforce. Quickly go to the third item. Okay, so there are a lot of people out there who worry about inequality. And there's a, a huge number of people that we could work with because we actually have the solution to addressing inequality and it's called adaptive and inclusive teaching and learning. Because if we don't address that, we can't actually bring the furthest behind along in, in the journey. And what is happening right now in many parts of the world is that we have a kind of cookie cutter approach to education and we deliver the same lesson to the same number of people in the same time. We need to move to multiple lessons, adaptive, interactive, much more inclusive. There's already evidence out there that this kind of interactive, some people talk about teaching at the right level, um, there are adaptive platforms, um, that that actually leads to huge learning improvements, particularly for those furthest behind. And this is also an area where technology can play a huge role. Adaptive platforms, artificial intelligence can actually provide the tools to get um, information on those who are furthest behind and then give them the right sort of learning tools to catch up and to basically catch up with those who are ahead. So reduce inequality by uh, uh, using these adaptive teaching, teaching approaches. The next one is, um, okay, I think this is an obvious one, and I know we have in the room the uh, wonderful head of WFP's uh, school meals program, school health and nutrition. Um, it is such an obvious one to promote. But again, um, even when you meet the wonderful boss of uh, Carmen, David Beasley, who's the head of the World Food Program, he talks about hunger around the world and issues of rising food prices. And so we should make sure that whenever he mentions that, we are at the ready and say, yes, but actually the way to address some of this hunger is by starting with young people and making sure that we deliver quality school meals and school feeding programs, because that can really address hunger very early on. And so let's, let's join that movement and make sure that we can get uh, interventions to the 370 million children who lost access to, during COVID and the 73 million who were already never getting uh, a meal uh, in, their, in their school day. So the other opportunity here is the collaboration with agriculture, um, home, uh, homegrown home school, school feeding is something that's being explored in a number of countries. Again, it has links to climate, to agricultural development, to local economic development. So let's make sure we're in those conversations. Um, uh, let me go quickly. The paths to the diverse paths to um, kind of skilling, again, that's intuitive. We need to work much more with the private sector to uh, make sure that people have diverse routes into skilling, diverse routes into certification, um, and making sure that they can um, uh, get the sort of learning in many, many different ways. And I think the, the collaboration with the private sector is really something we still need to uh, get much, much uh, better at to create this sustainable growth. And then the final one is obviously this big, big issue of climate change. Um, obviously, Issue five around adaptive, uh, around learning and skilling in different ways already gets at that. 
Um, but we have talked um, yesterday, or the first day, a lot about how do we make education much more central to adaptation, uh, for example. We have, last year at the COP26, nations declared that we should double the spending on adaptation. But when you ask people who work on adaptation, what do you spend this on? Mostly they talk about infrastructure, building seawalls, getting research on, on, on sort of new, new seeds and so on to withstand heat. But the best strategy for adaptation is education. It's building the resilience within people. And that's not only on the skilling side, basic skills and, and, and more advanced skills, but also actually using school infrastructure for adaptation. I lived in Vietnam for five years. The Vietnamese government decided to never again build a single story classroom. And the reason was, if you have two stories and there's a flood, actually that provides you a, a retreat. And so actually the school becomes part of the adaptation strategy because you can use that for the communities to actually, uh, when there are floods, to go and retreat. So um, the Fijian minister is here. She will talk about this too. Critical enablers, let's go through this quickly. People will talk about this leadership, connectivity. There's people in the room who will say something about that. data. I go to Accountable leadership. Yes. <laughs> good, good, uh, good uh, correction. So accountable leadership and partnerships at all levels. And then um, financing, I'll quickly say something about the financing because the report also on the next slide talks about a financing compact. Some of you may have heard um, some of the proposals that have been put forward at this, um, at this pre-summit under the finance track. And the spirit there is really one of a compact, asking countries to do more and do better and raise revenue but also actually a compact of the United Nations. Solidarity between those who have less and those who have a lot. And that means that we really need to up our game on the international finance. And we know that there's huge pressure on ODA. Yesterday we heard, what is it, 30 countries have cut their ODA for education. So we need to get smarter about finance. And so there are in the report or going to be a number of proposals about how do we get smarter? Um, one has to do with the multilateral development banks and the international finance facility for education. The second one has to do with the point about if you spend twice as much on adaptation, let's make sure we have some of this going to education. And the third one is around the philanthropic sector and the private sector getting much more engaged in this. So um, I hope this is the end of it, uh, because you're probably wondering where we are going. Um, just join us uh, uh, and read the report. Um, and we have some questions as well at the end, which I think Aish, are you going to, is Aish going to go through this? Sorry, that was a very anti-climatic end to a fantastic presentation. If we could give uh, Dr. Sir a huge round of applause. <laughs> As, um, as, as you said, I will be introducing these questions as conversations for the, as, as, as kind of guiding questions for the discussion later on. But they're also the questions that you'll be able to answer when you um, kind of go to the QR code. And um, it, it would be fantastic if all of you could provide feedback and encourage others to do so as well. Um, but thank you so much for the presentation. And um, we're now going to be able to start with some comments from the panelists. Um, and as you can see, there's quite a few of us here, so I'll be providing more detail about them as we go on. But just to kind of give you an overview of the fantastic lineup that we have today, um, we have uh, Her Excellency Maria Juliana Ruiz Sandoval, the First Lady of Colombia. Her Excellency Agnes Nanonye, I'm really sorry if I've got that wrong, the Minister of Education from Malawi. Um, Her Excellency Dipunoni, Minister of Education for Bangladesh. Uh, Her Excellency Pramila Kumar, Minister for Education, Heritage and Arts in Fiji, which is a co-chair of Action Track 5 on financing education for the Transforming Education Summit. 
We also have Alice Mukashiaka, a UN Foundation Next Generation Fellow, and Yuv Sumkur, a Youth Ambassador with Their World. So, as you can tell, each of our panellists have very diverse experiences and will probably have their own perspective about what the transformation of education looks like, as well as what it will take to bring it about. But this morning, I'll be asking each of you to share your thoughts on some of the win-win solutions and enablers, which Dr. Steer presented at the beginning of the session, um, that they're gonna, which are gonna drive progress, not just in education, but throughout the SDGs. And just before we begin, I'd like to kindly um, encourage panelists to keep their remarks to roughly three minutes, if possible. Um, but with all that said, uh, over to um, the first panelist, Her Excellency Maria Juliana Ruiz Sandoval, the First Lady of Colombia, who's been a steadfast champion for the interests of children and young people in her country and beyond for many years. So Your Excellency, which of the win-win solutions presented by Dr. Stibb particularly resonated with you. I know that you've been working kind of intensely to promote healthy school meals and greater opportunities for young people in Colombia. So it'd be fantastic if you could share more about this. Well, thank you very much. Special greetings to all the ministers, delegates, organizers, and uh, all the ones who are joining us this morning. It is truly an honor for me to be part of this meeting and this conversation overall, because one of my goals in life in order not to get at the end of the tunnel where this young woman was in the video is precisely to convene for positive communication and positive conversations. And I do believe this is a positive conversation that we must end up achieving as goals in action. So um, I would probably start by saying something that I see on the first question, and it's because it's really related towards how I define my role as First Lady, and is that when I assumed my role, I was a professional, I'm a lawyer, I decided just to give a different perspective to the First Lady's role that was usually uh, assigned towards a different uh, vision, so I, I found out that I needed, I didn't need it to go too far and we didn't need to move away even from SDGs. So SDG 17 for me allowed me to do two major responsibilities, convening and advocacy. So just thinking on that first question, how can the education sector better engage with other sectors? I would say have SDG 17 in mind. Partnerships is one of the best ways to get faster better and together to achieve goals, common goals. And uh, I'm not talking about just uh, a couple of signatures in one same document. I'm talking about real action and understanding the value and the share that each actor and multi-sectoral uh, approach means to one common cause. In the case of Colombia, and speaking clearly on, on school meals, we, we really understood that nutrition and education are essential for human development. Mm -hmm. And nutrition is essential to acquire knowledge. So in that same path, we link both nutrition and education. And we found out that definitely in Colombia, as in many other countries, schools were the major capacity for the state, for the families, to deployed um, an appropriate way to acquire micronutrients. So we can definitely burst the capacity of the kids to acquire knowledge. We, in that sense, we were lucky enough to have the president of uh, Colombia placing nutrition in the center of the country's agenda as a transversal issue. So it will tackle the whole food security system. And uh, in the school meals case, he designed, together with the Minister of Education, in a specific agency that will take care of what we call PAE, which is a Programa de Alimentación Escolar, which is the program for school meals, basically. And it had three major things that, for me, were uh, absolutely accurate in order to advance in this uh, process, and is to reassure that we were not going to fail in terms of corruption. 
because we know that in many of our countries and in developing countries, taking the meals to the schools in all over the, the country, that means a lot of things in between. So fighting corruption is one of the major objectives of this uh, a, a independent uh, agency. The second one is also to have in mind transparency. We are not dealing with simple things, we're dealing with lives because together with nutrition comes life reassurance and the possibility to have productive life projects. Um, and then this at the same time provided other uh, specific tasks to multi-sectoral approach, which was very uh, important. We were able to double, and this also tackles financing, we were able not only to have the willingness, but the action together with it, and is to double the um, national budget in order to achieve, as of today, something more than six million students with the, with the refunding of this program. And at the same time, something that I consider in a country like Colombia, which is extremely diverse, a priority is that we really engage with this also multi-diverse universe in Colombia, and is that we have a, not only biodiversity in our country, but biocultural and so ethnical approach and rural approach became a major issue and a priority in order to attend school meals. This, overall of these three things, I would say tackle and really impacted the food security system in specific areas from local products, because in thinking on ethnicity and thinking on rurality, we were also thinking on how to burst productivity of local products how to rescue local products with high, high nutritional uh, potential. Then we moved towards something that in Colombia became also a major um, issue linked with nutrition, but at the end affecting climate change, impacting sustainability, and is how can we really work on the way to reduce, hopefully eradicate waste and losses, mm -hmm. food waste and losses. So those two uh, points, starting with acquiring micronutrients and finalizing with how can we become more efficient in terms of food waste and losses, I think are a good framework that will allow us to, to, to move forward from what I do believe is probably and hopefully going to be the most powerful element that we will have in the future and is knowledge to foster our humanity. Mm. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for sharing some of your kind of lessons and learnings and experiences from Colombia. And also, I think, for really highlighting the importance of partnerships and the fact that it's an integral part of the SDGs. So, um, yeah, really fantastic way to get us kicked off. Um, so then, turning to our next panellist, we'll be hearing from Her Excellency Agnes Nalonye, the Minister of Education from Malawi, who is kind of renowned for her innovative education leadership. Um, Your Excellency, I'd like to ask you now, which of the kind of win-win solutions that Dr. Steer presented at the beginning of the um, session really resonated with you? Uh, thank you very much. Let me start by thanking uh, the Education Commission and Dubai Cares for uh, bringing me to be part of this uh, uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, thank you for that. Um, which of the win-win uh, solutions resonates with me? As Minister of Education, all of them do. <laughs> because all of them are about my job as Minister of Education. Indeed, I think this is a very critical moment to be a Minister of Education, uh, not just Minister of Education carrying the hopes and aspirations of the young people, Malawi is predominantly young, uh, uh, to be, to, to achieve uh, 
self-actualization and also to be the drivers of economic development uh, that will, for us in Malawi, uh, achieve what we set out to do last year when we adopted our long-term development plan, Malawi 2063, which says by 2063, we are going to be an inclusive, the wealthy, upper middle income country. And to do that, it is about developing a human capital. And in Malawi, under that uh, development plan, what we have done is to, um, at the very highest level, uh, the president has set up uh, a human capital development cluster, or rather within, the, uh, um, within that plan. What that human capital development uh, cluster does is uh, uh, it cements the approach to development that we've, we've taken uh, probably ever since they were, they, uh, time of HIV, which is a multi-sectoral approach. So the human uh, class, uh, capital development cluster includes Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Agriculture, Gender, Social Welfare and Development, Water and Sanitation, as well as Youth and Sports. These ministries together are what we in Malawi consider to be the human capital development ministries because they look after the brain, they look after the stomach, they look after general well-being, mental health, and uh, the environment in which we need to, without water and sanitation, even mm -hmm. if I did all the best in, in education, Malawi wouldn't move. So this uh, cluster at the high level, uh, technically, is driven by permanent sectors of all these ministries. And this year, because it's the founding year of our long-term development plan, it is chaired by none other than my permanent secretary who is in this room just now. And uh, so what, what, we're, what we are saying in that is that uh, these are important, but within that, education is the conductor of the human uh, capital development and by extension, it is the conductor of the uh, 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 orchestra of development, which means education is a conductor of SDGs because it, without education, you will not have the skills to power agriculture. You will not have the skills to power transport and uh, uh, public works. You will not have the skills for mining. We in education need to do our business before we can get to other sectors doing anything. But to do so, we need these other ministries to work together with us. And one other ministry that's very close to this is uh, uh, the, uh, in, in our country, is forestry and natural resources, which is the housing for environmental affairs. So all this being said, what is it that I, as Minister of Education, is trying to do to make sure that all those win-win solutions are in place? Uh, we are starting from a low base where, as I speak, only 15% of my youth in Malawi, which is a very youthful country, are in secondary school. 85% have no space. There is no space. So for us, for me as minister, I'm here, I'm on every other global stage to mobilize resources and say, we know what to do. We have a very capable workforce that can produce uh, uh, curriculums as needed, uh, change pedagogy and do what we do, the core business of education. We have the means to do that, but we don't have the schools. When everybody says, bring the girls to school, keep them in school, we don't have the schools. At primary school level, we need, at least for now, with 90% enrollment, we need over 90,000 classrooms. As I speak now, I only have 47,000 classrooms. So for me, when I say all that resonates, I would like to do the core business of education, which is giving the best education, giving the best foundational skills uh, uh, that are needed by Malawians. But to do so, I need education infrastructure. And I also need infrastructure for digitalizing education so that uh, what I can have for my country is a blended approach to, to education so that I, as Minister of Education, can achieve my legacy goal, which is to ensure that by 2030, I have laid enough of a foundation for children in Malawi to uh, obtain foundational skills by focusing on uh, putting the best teachers in the first four 
years of primary education, making sure that the curriculum is strong and it responds to aspirations of Malawians under the Malawi 2063 by making sure that the training and development and management of uh, teachers is such that it responds to what we're, to we're trying to do and by making sure that we have a universal school feeding program. Currently we're at 44 percent coverage. We need all our schools to have it. That's why even for school feeding programs all these ministries I, I mentioned we're working together. Our, our approach to school feeding is not just education, it's all these other ministries in the human capital development cluster that work together. Uh, we're also, uh, to achieve foundational skills, we're also looking at uh, digitalizing education, a broader platform that can make sure that even the most excluded, and we have children in Malawi that walk up to 30 kilometers to school, bring a school to them. If you can't, make sure you build uh, uh, hostels and so on at schools that exist, but bringing a school to them is the way to do it. Otherwise, make sure you strengthen digitalized education so that you can reach them with quality uh, education that includes children with disabilities, children from poor countries, and all other children, girls included. When that is done, I'll consider that I have uh, been at the foundation of creating a movement that has the possibility to produce young people that have come out of the education system having learned to learn, because that's the foundation of resilience. Learning to learn, meaning being adaptable. Whatever changes happen around you, you, sh you shape shift and you change. And that's my vision uh, for how the win-win will happen, can happen in Malawi. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind of resounding call to action, I think, on, on the importance of resourcing education and for all that you're doing to improve the prospects of young people in Malawi at the moment and really kind of already implementing this multi-sectoral approach that we've been talking about today. And I think also just what a fantastic way to frame education as a conductor of progress. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Your Excellency. Um, so our next speaker will be Her Excellency Deepu Morni, the uh, Minister of Education for Bangladesh. Um, Your Excellency, which of the win-win solutions really resonated with you? I know that you have a lot of experience working to improve the economic and social prospects facing children and young people in Bangladesh. So I think it'd be great to hear from you, especially how we can create diverse pathways for young people to build skills for their life and work. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, it's an honor to be here. My sincere appreciation to the Education Commission and the BICARES for organizing this uh, side event. Uh, I think uh, all the approaches that um, uh, Elizabeth, you have talked about, uh, sorry I missed the beginning, but I think we are trying to do almost all of it. And um, let me begin by saying that um, we have um, uh, formulated our new curriculum. And um, after many years of work, um, uh, this new curriculum is now being piloted. And or the results that the feedback that we're getting from the schools, from the teachers, from these learners, from the parents, it's just overwhelming um, how our students, the, uh, those who were not very interested to come to school now, how they are saying that, can we stay back for an, for an hour more and work? Um, because they're, whatever they're learning, they're learning by doing and not just um, memorizing things. So uh, it's completely different. It's um, personalized learning, learning by doing, and um, it's joyful learning. Uh, we're uh, very um, uh, uh, emphasizing on that, um, joyful learning very much. And then teachers, uh, the role of a teacher is, is completely changed. <clears throat> we say that it's from a sage on the stage, it's, it's a guide on the side, and uh, they are also enjoying it. Uh, so teachers' professional development comes uh, uh, in a big way in, in this whole uh, program. Then the school feeding program, 
that is also going on. We're expanding it to the whole country now. But the school feeding program is um, uh, it's designed in such a way that it's be become sustainable so that it's not just the government doing it. It's mostly the school, the community. Uh, it's the, mostly the community participation uh, for the school feeding program. And, and um, it's, it's working really well. Um, then uh, we're, we've come up with this blended education national master plan um, because uh, as um, I think um, all the panelists here, uh, we share similar problems and there are um, hard to reach areas in Bangladesh as well, though it's a very small country, but still there are. And uh, also uh, getting um, high quality education accessible to everyone, wherever they are. Uh, I think this blended education uh, is going to be very helpful. Connectivity and devices, these are challenges uh, for a resource constrained country like ours. Um, so in this master plan, we, we are thinking about all kinds of scenarios, high tech, low tech, even no tech, and how to deliver in all kinds of situations. Uh, <clears throat> then um, skills training. Um, there are 28 ministries in Bangladesh who actually work on different kinds of skills. And we are trying to now coordinate the work of all these ministries so that we can avoid duplications and uh, we avoid wastage of um, very um, important resources. Um, and I think in the Blended Education National Master Plan also, we are bringing in all these ministries uh, so that uh, we can um, work in a coordinated manner. Um, and and uh, uh, for the human resource development, uh, the skills that we identify, those are not just 21st century skills, but also um, uh, skills for the fourth industrial revolution and uh, and soft skills. Uh, uh, so, um, so these are these are the uh, approaches, and uh, one of the key elements uh, we think is uh, that um, teachers' professional development and also ensuring their um, financial and social uh, security. Uh, I think it's it's very very important. Um, and uh, we're, we're trying to look into that issue also, how we can improve that situation further. Um, so these are uh, the approaches um, that we are adopting. Uh, so we're very much, I think, uh, with, the, um, with the thinking uh, that um, this, this uh, exercise here um, is all about. And I was at the Rewired Summit in uh, last December in Dubai, and thank you, Tariq. Well, okay. <laughs> and um, I think um, all the decisions taken there and, and this model, I think this needs to be taken forward. Uh, this is a wonderful model, and I think this, uh, the accountable leadership and partnership at all levels, this, without that partnership, it cannot, and that partnership also must include not just governments, but NGOs, private sector, uh, everyone, because when it comes to education, it's everyone's responsibility. Uh, but um, it shouldn't be like it's everyone, so no one is responsible. No one is taking responsibility. That shouldn't happen. So this um, partnership and strong partnership is needed, and connectivity and technology nowadays, that is the key uh, for delivery. And uh, we must have evidence-based uh, policies uh, so these are all important, and the all most important issue is financing. And um, yes, it is good that we are um, uh, we are talking about mobilizing our own funds, um, build, I mean, uh, generating more revenues. But for many countries, it will be uh, impossible if there is no uh, international support. Uh, so that international support has to be garnered uh, and properly. Uh, so I think that's that's uh, very very important. And um, 
if we want to rewire education for people and the planet, which is our goal, uh, we need to have a generation which is um, uh, not just uh, amply uh, sensitized with the problems of our planet, uh, but also uh, very caring. And in order to, uh, I mean, on the issues like forced migration, um, climate change, inequalities, conflicts um, coming from our part of the world, these are uh, real issues and, and these are real issues for many, many uh, countries in the world. So our future education curricula um, uh, should address all these uh, problems uh, through engaging uh, those who are also victims. Um, so I think we're, we're trying to take our education out of the four walls of classrooms. We're trying to take our learners uh, to the fields, uh, engaging with real people, engaging with real problems, and then learn and um, use that learning. Uh, to build a better future for everyone uh, and care for people and planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. It's so great that you feel like the outcomes from the Rewired Summit are truly reflected in this report. I think it means that you know it's on the right track, which is fantastic. Um, and so great to hear about all of the kind of new um, like approaches that Bang Bangladesh is tri uh, trialing. And I think what really stood out to me was this commitment to encouraging children to kind of learn by doing and joyful learning, which I think is really, really encouraging and exactly what transformation of education is all about. Um, and you did also touch on the financing question, which I think is a kind of good segue now to the next speaker, which is um, who is Her Excellency Pramila Kumar, the Minister for Education, Heritage and Arts for Fiji, which, as I mentioned, is a co-lead of the Action Track 5 for the Transforming Education Summit um, on financing for education. So kind of as, I guess, a, a kind of overview of the win-win solutions that were presented, um, Your Excellency, how do you think we can actually start to finance some of these? Uh, well, thank you very much for the, for the invitation and to be part of this panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the point that I want to make is where she left. She left with the statement called, this is education's moment, which is so true. I... I will share my experience first before I answer your question. So I was a teacher, teacher educator, and I left teaching field completely. And then I joined environment. I was, uh, uh, after environment, I joined uh, trade uh, area, trade sector, and uh, of course, consumer protection and so forth. So I've done it all. And when I was first appointed, I became the Minister for Trade. So there you go. <laughs> so it was quite interesting. Then later on, uh, there was a reshuffle and, and of course education was given to me. When I came back to the education sector, and I'll be honest with you, I was so disappointed. I said to myself, in the last 25 years, what did we change in the classroom setting? Same thing, talk and chalk, chalk and talk, same way the classrooms are arranged, same curriculum, no change in the subjects that we offer. There's no feedback from the students. Teachers are in control and the government is pouring in money in the education sector. We have schools that are owned by communities. Uh, the community, the faith-based organization, they own the schools. Uh, government owns barely 13 uh, schools in the country. Yet government provides free education grant to the community to run the school. Mm -hmm. And similarly, we have removed the burden from the parents who used to fundraise previously to look after the school and, and at the same time uh, pay for, the, uh, for their child's school fees 
pay for the bus fees, buy textbooks, uh, etc., etc. All that burden has been taken away. So the government provides free tuition, free textbooks, bus fees, and even boat fees because of the geographical locations. Mm -hmm. And from last year, we started providing dignity packs to all our girl students. We're doing everything. So now the question is, why we are not getting the rate of return? And the rate of return we are looking forward to is very simple. We want the end product, the outcomes of education, that is our children that come out of the school system to become good citizens. They're peace, uh, peace lovers, tolerant, and they're able to improve their quality of life and their family's quality of life, and also contribute to the society in which they live. But that is not what we are seeing. We are not seeing that at all. What we are seeing, our education system, is so academic driven that there is no place for children who may not be, um, or, or you can say that they have got different abilities. There's no room for that. Yet we talk about inequalities. We talk about inequalities, but we are not addressing the inequality that actually exists in a classroom, where we're teaching same thing to all our children, same subjects, same methodology, as if once the children finishes off from the school system, they'll all end up at universities, they will all have a degree, they'll end up with a white collar job, and everything will be fine. But that is not the reality. What we are doing is we're frustrating our students in the classroom. They're, that's why they become, uh, they come out of schools. They are the dropouts. They're no longer interested. And they end up uh, in other mischiefs. So we need to change the school system. So that was my initial observation. And I was quite, as I said, I was quite disappointed with the whole system. But COVID-19 has given the world, and particularly the education sector, an opportunity to change things around because everyone is listening to us. As soon as we say the school was closed for eight months or one year or two years, and there has been a huge learning losses, and, and parents can experience that at home with their children who are no longer listening to them because they had all the freedom at home. And they're finding, they find it very challenging to mold the children and to put them into the right track. So all this is happening. And again, um, in Fiji's situation, we have seen at primary level, children are found with drugs. They come with alcohol. Uh, sexual harassment uh, matters are there as well. Now, obviously, the education system uh, you know, how we perceive education. We perceive it as if education sector is the sector that's going to solve all the ills of the society. We need to change that. We need to make parents responsible, society responsible, and the community that we live in. It's a shared responsibility and everyone has to play their role. We cannot and we should not expect teachers to take all this responsibility. And at the end of the day, we say, oh, the teacher was no good. He or she did not do uh, the right thing in the classroom. We should not even go there. So we need to have a holistic approach to change the system. So what have I done? I'll very briefly talk to you what I did. When I started off with this ministry, the first thing I did, I visited more than 100 20 schools, whether the schools were in maritime area, rural, peri-urban, urban. And that's how I managed to find out what exactly was happening in school. Because from the ministry's perspective, we make policies, we roll it out, but we don't know how well the policies are implemented. So going there, finding it out firsthand, how the policies are being implemented, whether it is uh, making any difference or not, made me come back to the ministry 
to change certain things within so that we can get the right result. So we started working with UNICEF. Uh, the, the first um, uh, uh, solution that is given here, expand integrated early childhood education. That was the first area that we picked with UNICEF. We are developing the early childhood. Uh, we're reviewing and developing the various policies, etc., for the early childhood, including the curriculum, uh, the feeding program, which the government is already providing, and so forth. But coming to the primary level, th this is uh, class one to class, uh, or level one to level three, uh, we have introduced new curriculum on numeracy and literacy, just numeracy and literacy, moral and civic education. We've removed the exams, no media exams, no annual exams, no grading of students uh, first, second, third, nothing of that kind. We just, we would like to see uh, the, the changes uh, in the child. And that's where the focus is, the real result. So that's how we're going to uh, evaluate uh, the students. We have also um, focusing on life skills. And uh, from, from uh, Your Excellency, level one. so sorry, I think if it's all right, could I ask you to please kind of wrap up your remarks? Okay, I could listen to right. you all day, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. So let me come to the last two things. Uh, one is the climate change, uh, which is a major issue for our country. And for climate change, adaptation is very important, and we've heard it around this table. Uh, climate change financing needs to focus uh, or focus away from just infrastructure development, but we need money for things like uh, um, technologies, so that when our classrooms are occupied uh, during cyclone, where, where it is used as uh, evacuation centers, um, education is not disrupted it can still be accessed by other children who are safe. And coming to the, uh, the, the financing uh, component, we can talk about all the good things we want, but without money, we cannot achieve anything. And I support the idea of having this international uh, financing facility uh, to support uh, low and middle income countries so that they can uplift the education system and they can bring about the major reform that is required in each and every country. So that, that's the only way uh, we can see changes globally and, and produce, or you can say, the outcomes that come out of uh, education system will then become more meaningful. Otherwise, it's just putting money into the system and it's draining out, not giving the right outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing how you're kind of already um, implementing this holistic approach to learning and, and kind of elaborating on how we can really seize this moment or opportunity for education. Um, you know, as they say, time flies when you're having fun. So I think we're uh, somewhat running over time. So if I could encourage the next two panelists to be as brief as possible. Um, but over, so the next person we actually have speaking is one of my colleagues, Alice Mukashiaka, who's a UN Foundation Next Generation Fellow, leading an action group of young people mobilizing around the Transforming Education Summit. And Alice is also an advocacy manager for livelihoods and education at Restless Development. So Alice, which of the win-win solutions really stood out to you? Thank you so much, and I'm so delighted to be part of this exciting panel and uh, seeing people that I meet at the Rewired Summit, such as Her Excellency Deepu and uh, His Excellency Tariq back at the Rewired Summit. It's so exciting to be on the same panel with these big people. And um, after Rewired Summit, Racist Development and the Scouts uh, convened an action group of young people that made to really see the priorities of young people, uh, the, the, what young people are saying in terms of transforming education. And excitingly, those priorities merge the win-win solution five that highlights uh, the needs to create diverse and certifiable routes for youth to 
to build skills to promote sustainable and economic growth. And young people highlighted the key avenues where this solution could be achieved. And number one is the recognition of non-formal education and ensuring that young people have the avenues to encourage to um, access uh, soft skills and uh, have a, having access to transferable skills before entering into the workforce. Number two, young people share there is a need to invest in um, high quality digital content uh, that is adaptable to local context and cater diverse needs of young people, including those with disabilities and possibly having a global compact with technological companies that making this digital content, content um, accessible. And thirdly, is making enough open sources for young people because it's really needed more than ever in making sure that young people are skills that strengthened and their learning is really supported. And lastly, as uh, most of our panelists said, we really need the power of young voices trying to bring us on the table, contributing on these kinds of reports and supporting the ministries as well. Because we're here and we're ready, we have the energy, we have the enthusiasm and ready to take action. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Alice, and I really do feel that energy from you this morning, so that's great. Um, so our next speaker is um, Yu Sunko, who is a youth ambassador with Their World. Um, Yu also recently founded his own organization called Food, Water, Hygiene Mauritius, which aims to provide essentials to underprivileged communities in his home country. So Yu, which of the win-win um, solutions really resonated with you? I know that you're kind of particularly interested in the nexus between climate change and education, so it'd be great to hear more about that. <laughs> Many thanks for the introduction, Aish. I would first like to express how grateful I am to share the floor today with such inspiring decision makers. It's a big opportunity for me and I'm grateful for it. When I think of the link between education and climate change, the first word that comes to mind is the notion of fairness. As a youth representative from small island states, I'm here to share the reality of the unfairness that I see in my community every day. As a 22-year-old from Mauritius, the greatest threat is the climate crisis. As Minister Kumar touched upon a little bit earlier, um, one of the most ravaging cyclones in the last five years touched my country, Cyclone Batsurai. More than 400 people sought shelter in welfare centers and 7,000 homes were wrecked by either being flooded or left with no electricity. This impact is yet relatively small compared to Madagascar, where 100,000 people were left displaced uh, by the storm. Because of this cyclone, the lives of many men, women, and children were altered for the worst. These disastrous events have a huge impact on the educational environment in my country and in small island states more generally. During to tropical cyclones in Mauritius, many children are denied access to schools, course materials, or proper teaching methods. While these children stay home, I see in my community how the poorest and more, most marginalized children cannot continue their learning as they do not even have access to the internet or cannot even do their homework at night because there's simply no electricity. While we are making the effort to put climate at the forefront of our national policies, we're still waiting on big amateurs to act upon their promises. I believe that it is important to remind that small island states are the most vulnerable countries to the effects of climate change and yet are only contributing to less than 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Access to education should not be challenged by human-induced climate change, and the future of our society should not be sunken by our past failures. Climate change is denying access to free and fair education. However, I believe that if we work collaboratively, education can unlock the change we need to solve this crisis. I particularly like the sixth action point of the Re Rewired Report, which states that education systems should build climate resilience, and I believe that it should also boost innovation. New carbon-free technologies are still very expensive and cannot be afforded by everyone. We need innovation to decrease the costs of these new technologies. If we're going to shape the next generation of brown, brown, groundbreaking engineers and renewable energy pioneers, we must ensure fair and safe access to education. 
I would like to conclude by saying that this is not a demand but a right, and we must answer the call of young, small islanders when they are saying, let me learn. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yoga, for sharing some of your experiences and for that really timely reminder about why we need to act now to solve both the climate crisis and its exacerbating effects on the learning crisis. Um, so now, last but certainly not least, the final panellist that you'll have a chance to hear from is His, His Excellency Dr. Tariq al Gurg, who, as I said, is the Chief Executive of du uh, Dubai Cares. Um, Your Excellency, I'm going to ask you a slightly different question to the rest of the panellists, as I had the opportunity yesterday to hear you mention your work in developing a framework for education ecosystem transformation. So today I'd like to ask you how we can really start to embed this multi-sectoral approach of win-win solutions and enablers into the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Thank you, Aishwara, Aishwarya. Um, I'm going to change things a bit in the agenda. I, sure. I, because we've been talking about school feeding and we've been talking about technology. And I can see Alex Wong here from ITU and Carmen Barbano from WFP. I would like to give them a chance to talk uh, a bit. So I'm going to shorten my answer just to give them a chance to talk as well, because I think these are two main elements uh, in, 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 the, in the agenda. Um, we're here at the Transforming Education Summit. This has never happened in the world. It has never happened in human history. We are always talking about how can we have better education systems, how we can upgrade our systems, how can we fine tune our systems, how can we learn from COVID and school closures and how we embedded technology and how can we evolve on this technology. And this is the best talk to have in an education conference. But this is not an education conference. This is a transformation of education conference. And when we're talking about transformation, it means you take the existing one with your right foot, you just shoot it like the Colombians do and right into the net in the goal and replace it with a new one. We cannot keep on doing these tweaks and putting those patches into those systems and the current systems that we have. I go and copy a Fiji system and take a bit of that and some from Malawi, some from Finland and say, this is my, as I learned from a speaker, uh, 10 days ago, this is my Frankenstein. So, so, so we, we can't do that. We can't create a Frankenstein. Each country has a context. Each country has its own needs. What we need is probably an ecosystem, a drawn ecosystem, to be a guiding framework for all the countries to look into. Now, do we have a system which is an education system which is inclusive? Do we have an education system which has connectivity and technology built and embedded within it? Do we have an ecosystem, an education system that has um, um, well-being of children in terms of school health and nutrition? Do we have a system that can actually take the out of school children and give them a new lifeline to jobs without having a school certification? Do we have a system that we can predict what are the training needs that we have to customize on the skills that we have today to upskill them for the future jobs? Do we have a system like this? Well, well, I would, I would be a bit um, um, selfish and say we do have a system. We, we have been designing one for the last five years. And when I say us, I mean Dubai Cares. And, and, and I swear to you, we did not bring any consultant. It was just me and one team member working on this for the past five years. And we created that system. And I showed it to all the strategic partners of Rewired, which 11, I don't, I don't want to go through all the names, but uh, ITU, WFP, UNICEF, UNESCO, uh, Amina Mohammed, uh, Gordon Brown, and, 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 and so on and so forth. We have the World Bank, we have the OECD, and we have the World Economic Forum. And I believe I mentioned all of them. Uh, and anyway, so, so we designed this, and it came through our 15 years of experience. And we have programs in 60 countries. We have over 108 
research documents on all the thematics in education. And what the system does, we launched it last March. Actually, we're going to unveil it to the world at, at the test. Now what we're doing, we're just taking feedback. And it's basically, uh, if we instill the right core competencies in our children from now on the future human that we want, then we can make it happen. The, the biggest issue today, the biggest problem all countries are asking themselves, we need to transform edu education. What do we need to do? How can we take this system and modify it and make it? That's the wrong question. What we believe that the question should be, what is the future human that I want in 2040, 2050, or probably 2000, or, uh, sorry, 2063 in Malawi? Us UAE, we go, we're very ambitious, we go 2071. We won't even be alive at that time. But anyways, um, um, the reason it's 2071, it's because that's our centennial, and that's the promise that our government gave to the world, that we will sell the last barrel of oil in 2071, and we will celebrate for that. So there is a vision. So if every country has their own vision, I'm sure every country can predict the future human of that time. So let's, let's work backwards to see what kind of skills we have to instill in our school children today, in curriculums, in extracurricular activities, so we can make that happen. Certification and accreditation to out-of-school children, well, it's easy. If the private sector, and you did mention it, uh, Excellency, if the private sector works closely with the Ministry of Economy, and you wear both hats, um, um, to identify all the skills in a country, all the jobs in the country, all the future jobs, and then speaks to the Ministry of Education to put training needs and a criteria to certify those kids, those youth who are out of school, who don't have jobs, and give them that specialized accreditation on that skill, at least that person will earn something, not, not the full thing that they wanted. So we have that system. It's ours. It's inclusive. It's ours that is gifted to the world. It's online. It's on the portal of tests. As if my mind is concerned, it's owned by the United Nations now. And the UN Deputy Secretary General, she loved it. She thinks this is a starting point as a guiding framework to the world to look into and then customize their own um, 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 system based on the context of each uh, uh, country. And, and I just want to wrap up by saying this system looks at each country cross-sectoral, so it leaves no one behind. And that's what's important nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. I think um, this framework just sounds really exciting and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it's developed and taken up over the next few years. And it's so great to hear also the kind of long-term vision and thinking that you have in, in Dubai. It doesn't really matter if you're not going to be here in 2071 or if none of us are. It's, it comes back to what we started this session off with, this, this question of legacy, which I think is fantastic. Um, so, as as, um, you, as you suggested, I think we'll take then comments from um, Carmen and Alex um, from the floor. And if it's all right, I'd like to exercise my moder moderator's rights. I've just spotted Paul in the corner, who's a young person we've been working with. I'd like to take a comment from him too. For the rest of you, I'm really sorry. I think we've run out of time for comments from the floor, but do remember that you can still contribute and provide your feedback through um, kind of look going on the QR code of the card that you've got and, and providing your feedback to the win-win solutions and enablers that have been presented. Um, but with that then, I'll hand over to um, Carmen to introduce yourself. Thank you so much. My name is Carmen Burbano and I'm the Director of School Health and Nutrition for the World Food Programme. Um, thank you so much, first of all, Ms. Beth Tariq and, and all the speakers for, for this event. Uh, you started the session, Lisbeth, by asking why are people not on the streets? This is one of the most important crises we're living through. Children are out of school. They've lost an education. Many children will never come back. Why are budgets being cut? And when they're being cut, this is the sector that they're being cut from. ODA is also diminishing. So we're having a bit of a squeeze all around on the education sector. This summit and this process is really um, an attempt to put this issue back on the agenda, but why is this not 
you know, at the top, like climate, like other issues. And I, I think that, as you mentioned, it's really imperative that the education sector connect this conversation to the global conversations, to climate, to the food crisis that's happening, to the rising poverty crises. I mean, there was a G7 at the same time that we were here in Paris, leaders were making decisions around the food crisis in Germany. There was huge headlines all around the world because people are starving and going hungry. And I've been sitting here for three days, and this is the first mention of the food crisis that I've heard in this entire meeting. So there's a problem in terms of looking outward, in terms of reaching out to other sectors, in terms of connecting and the relevance of the education sector with what's really hurting people's pockets. When parents are going uh, home and they really don't have food to put on the table, that's what's hurting people right now. And if we're not connecting education, sending children to school on an empty stomach, making sure that they are healthy and able to learn, then all of the rest of the solutions that we're talking about here, we could just toss them in the trash if we're not really talking about the context in which children are living in, the well-being of these children to be able to take advantage of, of those education opportunities. So one of the things that I wanted to say is this panel has been one of the most refreshing panels because the refresher because first it's the call with to connect with other sectors and that I think is one thing that I haven't heard really in the conversations and second specific concrete solutions that's the other thing that I think we've seen in this panel so this shouldn't be a side event this should be actually in the main plenary we hopefully should have seen something like this in the first day or even today you guys should be seated in that big big uh, uh, room on the other side. Let's go and take that over. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but my main point is that we started this conversation in Rewired, and thank you to Dubai Cares for, for really getting us started. That was really important. Carrying this into this summit is really, the pre-summit is important. My plea to you is I'd like to see this in the main outcome of this test. Because if we leave it as kind of a side event, if this is, this should be in the Secretary General statement. It should be kind of one of the main outcomes, these concrete solutions, because also they are connecting to the other sectors, which is so important. <laughs> Finally, I just wanted to say, I mean, thanks to the First Lady of Colombia for her leadership around school health and nutrition, the President's leadership on really scaling this solution up to the entire country, connecting with other sectors. You mentioned SGG 17 and the importance of partnerships. This issue of promoting in this summit scalable evidence-based solutions that governments are already prioritizing, but in many cases, and in Malawi and in Bangladesh and in other countries, there's a need for better country-to-country -country sharing, for best practices, for financing of these solutions. And there are coalitions, there are initiatives that are designed to do just that. For the school health and nutrition angle, it's the School Meals Coalition, but there are many other coalitions behind each of these different initiatives that should also be highlighted in this conversation. I just want to congratulate all of you for one of the most interesting and refreshing initiatives. The, the most, Terry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen, and I couldn't agree more. In fact, one of the young activists who is here on the first day asked um, everyone in the plenary session to raise their hands if they were outside of the education sector, and I think only three or four people did. So we really do need to move this conversation outside of this silo. Um, so then I think we do still have time for quick remarks then from Alex Wong and Paul. Alex, over to you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so my name is Alex Wong, Chief of Special Initiatives at the ITU. ITU is the UN agency on ICT, so we're not in the education sector, we're, but we're really pleased to be here. We're really pleased and proud to be a partner of the Rewired Global Declaration. And our, our contribution is going to be on school connectivity. So this is one of the key enablers, as identified here, and also highlighted in Action Track 4. 
Um, I don't need to go into more of the statistics. We all know how many millions of children do not have access to digital tools, and ministers talked about hybrid learning, digital learning, um, blended learning, that's going to be essential. So our contribution really to uh, the rewire declaration and this broader uh, test is around the uh, GIGA initiative, uh, which I'm the co-lead of, uh, ITU, together with UNICEF. So we believe we have a scalable model. It's a project that's been running for over two years now. Uh, we have activities now happening in 19 countries, and we have a methodology. It's about how do we finance school, school connectivity by starting with knowing where every school is, mapping it, knowing where all the connectivity exists in the country, the fiber, the internet access points, and designing solutions that we can now make available for investors who can now maybe partner with the governments and uh, finance the connectivity of the schools. And part of that is going to be how do we find some of these innovative models of financing so that it tracks the additional investment that will be needed because public finances can't do it alone. How can we mobilize the fact that connecting a school connects a community and that you can generate revenue models from the surrounding community that uses that connectivity? How can we leverage domestic sources like universal service funds um, that can then serve as a, as, a, as a concessional level of finance for the connectivity? And I'll finish off by um, adding some final news, maybe exciting for those in the UN world, but we just completed our development conference in Kigali. Dr. Tarek was one of our speakers, but afterwards, we had a resolution that was unanimously adopted in plenary. That means it didn't have to be negotiated. And it was submitted by Rwanda and backed up by Azerbaijan, Gambia, Jordan, representing the Arab region, India, Kyrgyzstan, Lithuania, Namibia, Spain, Switzerland, UK, USA. They all stood up to support a resolution for the ITU to connect every person and every school to the internet and the ICTs. So we have to do this now, actually, as part of our mandate and our contribution to the, to the declaration and to the test. So thank you very much, all. Congratulations, that does actually sound like a huge achievement. So that's really fantastic. Um, and Paul, over to you. Yes, thanks Aish and thanks everyone. My name is Paul Clara. I'm, I have actually been working for UNESCO for the past 10 months uh, towards greening the organization. And I, I think I might speak on behalf of others in this room if, when I say that I've been honored uh, to witness what UNESCO is actually meant to provide a space for. This has been really an encouraging uh, conversation. And I would like to contribute with major, mainly one, one point. I'm here for World Scouting, which is the world's leading uh, educational youth organization. Uh, we have 57, uh, 57 million members that we equip with the skills to be active citizens, to, to be local leaders in their communities. So this is a relevant work and was, um, the World Organization has actually been co-organizing co this event. And um, scouting in an essence is an educational method that is, equips young people with skills. And this is where our con conversations connect because I've heard from, from Your Excellency from Malawi um, about foundational skills. I've heard about adaptiveness. I've heard about resilience. I've heard about learning by doing. And this is, in, in essence, what scouting is about. So my um, concluding remark will be that, in fact, if you want to see young people in the position to themselves be able to contribute to not only one SDG, but all SDGs as a whole, invest in non-formal education, which is the tool to connect what, what schools or what formal educational institutions cannot provide solely. So this is really my message, that every young person is capable of doing that contribution, but we need the structures, we need the organizations, we need the financial support around it. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, as in, I think we have just spotted uh, Sabrine, who's the head of sustainability at HSBC. It'd be great if you could uh, say a few words. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be very, very quick. Can, can everyone hear me? Uh, good morning. Hi. Um, I'm here representing the private sector, and I'm, I'm really happy to hear that um, everyone recognizes the need for partnership. I think three main things. It's incredibly important to have us as a part of the conversation at the right time. So as you redesign this curriculum for the future, engage us at the start, not at the end. Many times we are left with perhaps, um, I guess, a part of the problem. We employ, we, we have to retain the talent that comes. 
and often we know some of the, the impacts that we have to deal with. So let us feed some of the issues that we face as employers as well. Um, on, the, on the topic of financing, um, I think it's incredibly important that you work collaboratively with large institutions like, like us. Um, we represent a huge investor base who um, are incredibly interested in social financing. But if you want a flow of finance, especially to emerging markets, you need to define what success looks like. It needs to be impact and outcome driven. There needs to be consistent definitions of what that means, the same way we have the same narrative on climate. This is why there's been such an increased flow of finances to the topic of climate, because of that consistent taxonomy for investors. Um, and I think the last thing I wanted to say is COP27, 28, it's coming to the Middle East. I'm sure Tarek and I will work very closely on that, but incredible opportunity for the education sector to come together. So I think we should use that as a platform because adaptation is one of the key pillars for the Egyptian government, um, as well as the just transition. So the reskilling of so many sectors that will soon maybe not be redundant, but will need to heavily decarbonize, which will mean that there will be large numbers of people that will need to be redeployed. So again, another relevant place for the education sector to be a problem solver for um, a group of people that may not be just the youth. So that's all I want to say. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabrine. And um, in the interest of promoting partnerships, I do believe we have an MP from Tanzania. Um, you have, I think, we'll have about a minute uh, for you to make a statement. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much. So my name is Nima Lugangira. I'm a member of parliament from Tanzania and also a member of the International Parliamentary Network on Education. What I must say, which is um, kind of very unfortunate, in all of these wonderful discussions, we seem to forget a key stakeholders and that is parliamentarians. Um, to be very honest, whenever we're talking about financing, at the end of the day, parliamentarians have a critical role in ensuring that, one, governments do take up the right financing, we do get the right deals, but two, an oversight to ensure that the financing that has been taken actually gets used for, you know, for what it was intended for. So I, I would like to reaffirm the importance that we must remember parliamentarians, and parliamentarians are not government. Oftentimes it's assumed that, we, that we've spoken to government, so we've spoken to parliamentarians, but actually we have not. So, um, so, so I have a question. Yes. So can you influence the Minister of Finance, or the Minister of Finance ca should hear you, or you have so, the power? So basically... What, what's the thin red line? Basically, parliamentarians are the boss of government. In Parliament, ministers are below parliamentarians. That is the reality. So we have the power and ability to influence. However, for us to be able to do that, we need to be capacitated to understand these different dynamics. So what I would like to reaffirm is that please include and engage and capacitate parliamentarians because we're a key component in making sure we succeed in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think a really incisive comment for which uh, for, to, to end on. Um, it's been a pleasure moderating. I'm now going to turn over to Dr. Algo to kind of say the final remarks for this well, session. I'm, I'm not going to take, thank you, uh, Aishwarya. Um, I'm not going to take long. Um, I just want to mention that we're, we're working with a lot of organizations in the world from the private sector, NGOs, UN, uh, academia, researchers, think tanks. We work with everyone to make Rewired a success. And the legacy continues. Uh, whether there is tests or no tests, we are still the education sector and we will continue to flourish education. And uh, um, um, I have also Credit Agricole there. Uh, we've been working with them for the past year and a half to, 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 to construct a, a social impact bond in school feeding. And we connected them with the WFP and a few other organizations. And hopefully it will be one of the first social impact bonds within the UN system. 
um, um, uh, and, 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 and he's here to listen. And yesterday there was another colleague of his who came on the financing uh, bit. So thank you very much. The story continues. The legacy, the journey continues. We're not stopping here. Even if TESS stops after September, we're not stopping. We're just part of the education agenda and the reform and the transformation. Thank you very much. Okay.